Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am, whoop, I'm a little, I'm peeking. Uh, I'm Matt Ingenthrone, um, and uh, with me is uh, Michael Nitchinger. Uh, which I, I probably didn't quite get his uh, name quite right, but um, how was uh, the opening session this morning? Good stuff? Cool. Uh, now I get the honor of trying to follow up uh, after Brian Cantrell, so I'll, I'll, see, I'll see what I can do to try, try to keep it a little entertaining. The Davids here have already given me a hard time and said that they're expecting a lot from me, so uh, we'll see where we end up. So first off, I do have to start with a little bit of a warning. In this session, you will hear stories of things like lost packets and corrupted data, possibly even a confused system administrator or two, uh, terabytes of logs going to other confused developers. Uh, you'll, you'll hear about other very scary sorts of things. If the thought of a bit flip frightens you, if, the, um, uh, if you have only parity checking and no error correction, this session may not be for you, okay? So, just a warning, if you, may, you may want to go to another session. You, know, you could go upstairs where they're talking about mobile app development and you know, things don't fail and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, the other thing is we did harm a couple computers in preparation of this talk. Luckily, there is no American Society for the uh, Protection of Computers, um, there, but uh, that's okay. Um, now, if what you normally type after catch involves the word log, then you might actually learn a, two, a thing or two here. <laughs> If, uh, if you don't know how you would use an HTTP 503, you know, this is a good place to, to learn. Uh, funny, funny side note, um, I tweeted it, this out, so Brian Cantrell had mentioned this morning something about modular eCache parity errors. That's actually a reference to, uh, to a hardware problem that we had at Sun. Brian and I both worked at Sun, and I used the same reference here. So when I talked about uh, having uh, parity checking and no error correction, because there was actually a series of processors that had um, no error correction circuitry, but only parity, uh, you know, could only, you know, so it, it could tell that your data was corrupt, but it couldn't do anything about it except say, panic, and the whole machine would crash. That was actually the E10K. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, uh, sort of funny. I didn't think about that till just now. So, um, to try to make it a little entertaining, we're going to go into a little bit of a shame, uh, a game show. So uh, we're, we're, we've taken some things that we've seen in the field and we've turned them into a game show. Um, but first, in any given presentation, you have to have an obligatory raising of hands. So uh, first, who here has used Couchbase? Excellent. Almost everybody. Okay. Now, who here has ever seen something like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a couple uh, interesting things about Catchbase, right? So your traditional uh, database, your traditional relational database, you'll, you, I actually looked at one point uh, in the very early days of Catchbase. For those who don't know me, I, 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 uh, in, in the very early days, I was the guy who did the SDKs, sort of. Uh, then later, uh, I hired smarter people than me. Uh, and we, uh, <laughs> we, did you wave? <laughs> Uh, so later, uh, and so we, we, we had to make some decisions. From the Memcached days, there were actually some, some interesting things, like Memcached had, uh, most of the clients had a one second timeout. There were some problems with that, which I could get into. Uh, but the reality is, with a relational, uh, with traditional relational databases, back in that era, I actually went and looked at some of the source code, like, eh, what is the Postgres driver? What does MySQL do? And a lot of them have these like 60 to 90 second timeout ranges. If they don't get anything back, They'll, they might uh, disconnect. Some of them had things like, you know, the programmer just said, eh, 600, you know, 600 milliseconds later. So I don't know how long that query is supposed to run. Um, and we had, on the other hand, we were kind of coming from this memcached world where if it's not fast, there's something wrong because we were typically accessing main memory. So um, the reality is that, there's the, uh, that if you're talking about a lot of those uh, traditional systems, they just slow down, right? If you're talking about Couchbase, frequently you'll see something like a timeout which I would actually argue, and you'll hear a little bit about later, is a good thing. Uh, but now that we've been through the obligatory raising of hands, let's get on to the game show. Ready? So who wants to be 100 air? <laughs> now, <laughs> <da -da -da. laughs> now the reason it's 100 air instead of millionaire is because we're talking latencies frequently, right? Uh, most of the time, most of you guys are developing apps that are, for, uh, that are interactive apps, and if the, if the user's waiting thousands of seconds or millions of seconds, uh, I don't even know how long a million seconds is, and, <laughs> but uh, that's not a good thing. So we actually want some things that, we want latencies to be very low. So our goal here is to be 100 error. So we're gonna look at a couple of things that we've seen 
deployed out in the field. So question one, um, given a system that has virtual machines at a public cloud provider, and it's a Node.js application, and what you're seeing is that under load testing, there are high latencies, greater than 100 milliseconds. Your goal is to be under 100 milliseconds. What are the possible causes? Is it A, bugs in Couchbase, <laughs> B, the system software wasn't well matched and tested, C, running too many processes, uh, Node.js processes for the number of CPU cores, or is it D, the cosmic rays, man? Just, just to give you a hint, it's never A, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you can rule that out already. <laughs> okay, yell out, yell out your answers. See? 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 Uh, it turns out the answer actually is B. Uh, the answer, the root cause in this particular investigation was that the Ethernet, it was a very you know, odd sort of issue that you'd run into. The Ethernet device driver in that particular Linux distro didn't work well with the virtualized hardware that they were running. So you, you're emulating an Ethernet device, and you've got a, 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 a kind of a fuzzy device driver, a, a questionable device driver. So in that particular case, the solution was to swap out the Linux distro uh, for one that was run more often. In effect, what that user did is they went from one that was less common but had um, really good UI uh, for production applications to one that is uh, more common for uh, production deployments. And, and I, you know, it, it's just one of those things that um, uh, I, I, I certainly, you know, having worked for a hardware manufacturer, I've certainly seen all the odd little cases that you can run into as you're trying to match those things. Okay, so question two. The system is now a private virtual, a set of private virtual machines. By the way, these are all live deployments. I'm not gonna tell you who they, where they were. Um, on a private cloud, and they had really strong monitoring uh, and control of the environment. Um, as daily load would ramp, latencies would go up, and they'd start missing their SLA on a regular basis. So. What are the possible causes? Is it A, bugs in Couchbase, B, JVM gar garbage collection pauses, C, virtualization is over-provisioned, or is it D, the NSA wiretap program <laughs> is slowing things down? B? Oh, we may, we may actually have to pull with hands on this one. Okay, all those in favor of B? Okay, all those in favor of C? Oh, okay, the C's have it. I was actually on the B side when, when uh, we were working on this one. Uh, C is the answer. So they had over-provisioned, um, they'd over-provisioned memory in their virtual, uh, in, in their VM environment, but all of the symptoms looked very much like B because you'd, you'd go uh, look at uh, garbage collection pauses and you'd see these things like, you know, par new collection, 30 seconds. How, you know, how could that happen? Uh, there looked like there was something very, very wrong there, tuning-wise. So, um, the uh, root cause, as I said, uh, memory resources were over-provisioned in the private cloud. Uh, the fix was actually to, oops, this is gonna flash. Sorry about that. Uh, the fix was uh, to adjust the memory allocation. In the process, though, in the investigation, we found a few other things, like uh, the number of Tomcat workers was rather unusually set. I don't know if you remember, it was set to? 300, 400. Set to, yeah, set to like three or 400 for uh, eight virtual cores. So lots and lots of, of uh, uh, threads uh, trying to beat the heck out of these. I, I had to ask if they were running on a supercomputer first. <laughs> but, um, probably. Yeah, it wasn't an E10K, yeah. And the, and the funny thing was that they were going for mostly for a latency sort of a problem, not a throughput-oriented problem. Typically, you might see that if you're really trying to get maximum throughput and don't care about latency. So question number three, ready? Now, in this environment, the system was running on physical hardware, but, uh, at least the, the, um, the database side. Uh, applications were on VMs across a network. Uh, the SLA required was about 50 milliseconds or less. Uh, and what was observed was a regular heartbeat um, of high latency in the three to 400 milliseconds. So it'd be super fast. I mean, in, in their environment, it was 10 gigabit ethernet. You'd see these latencies that were, um, actually, honestly, you'd see these latencies that were uh, <coughs> frequently like sub, uh, sub 100 microsecond a lot of the time. So super fast, late, super low latencies. 
And then every once in a while, it would go up to three or 400 milliseconds. So what are the possible causes? Is it A, bugs in Couchbase, B, misconfigured load balancer sending all the traffic to one JVM, C, a monitoring system uh, interrogating the kernel and causing lock contention, or is it D, standing ways from running a 50 hertz power supply in a 60 hertz data center? C, C, no one's going with B? Okay. <laughs> now they're not sure. Do we have to hand poll again? Uh, we, we won't hand poll because we got to move on. So the answer actually is C. Uh, the root cause in that particular s uh, scenario was they had a monitoring system that was just, you know, looking at, at the proc file system, just gathering counters and sending it off for later analysis. And uh, one way or another, that was hitting a hot lock uh, in the kernel. And so that was causing that on a regular basis. So they disabled that one polar. Um, the interesting thing was that this was the same setup that this particular deployment had for tons of other applications, and they'd never seen this problem before. So, you know, you, you sort of start in the discussion of, well, you know, our, our environment's very sound, right? But most of the other applications weren't actually looking at latency. So. Sure, just to repeat the question, the, the question is, was the monitor running within Couchbase? And the answer is no. Actually, all it was was uh, it's your, your typical operating system level monitor, just looking for the number of, uh, you know, what, how much memory are you using right now, how, how, many, how much disk I.O. have you had recently. It's just looking in the proc file system, you know, how many processes are running. But one way or another, it was, it was tripping over a hot lock in that particular version of Linux that would keep you know, the, the, the user space is saying, please send this data, and the kernel's like, I'm busy answering this question right now. Uh, you know, somebody wants to know how many processes are running. I'll, I'll take care of your data later. And so the, the operating system had, a, had basically, a, I would call that a bug there. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to just give you a couple of those stories from the field, uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael, who's gonna talk a little bit about how you plan for success. Thank you, man. All right, so a quick, uh, note on the on the on those three examples here. They all ended up with timeout exceptions in the client, right? So I probably th I thought about starting a drinking game every time I got a support ticket. That there's a timeout exception. What's going on in the system, right? Yeah, let's let's step, take a step back and see what's going on there, right? All right. But we, we'll talk about timeout uh, exceptions and timeouts a little bit later. First, let's talk about how can we minimize the possibility that something goes wrong in our system, and or how can we plan for that. And there's, of course, lots to that topic, and we try to fit it into like 30 minutes or 15, 20 minutes, just to give you a, a few thoughts or starting points where you can start your investigations from there on. So one of the main problems that we see out there is that reliability concerns are always an afterthought, right? You do your requirements, you build your applications, and then you think, oh, we probably should make that more resilient, but then most of the time it's too late. So what, what I'd recommend is that when you're writing your requirements, you already need to think about SLAs, throughput, latency, and so forth. So you basically, you already need to put your reliability requirements into the requirement specification of your application, and you need to think about it from the start, not as an afterthought, right? So once you've defined your requirements um, during development time, make sure you, you program in techniques like error detect detection, recovery, and mitigation right away, and we'll see some techniques how, how you can do that a little later, right? It's quite important here. Now then, of course, you need to do testing. And by testing here specifically, we don't mean unit testing or integration testing. We're talking about stress testing, load testing, and failure testing, right? Those things which not only take your application server into account and you're mocking out your database queries, right? Here it's really about including the network, including the database, including your endpoints, right? Everything and make sure, like it's running in production, you want, you want to test it under the nearly the exact same environment to make sure it's running uh, as you've designed it. <laughs> and then finally, of course, you need to measure because what you cannot measure, um, you cannot, you can't manage what you don't measure, right? And if you if you don't measure your results, you have no no way to evaluate them. So measure your test results, evaluate them, and then of course, finally, performance testing and and testing for failures is always an iterative process, right? You're not done at some point. Requirements change, you, new features come in, so you evaluate your measurements. And then you, you, feed you feed them back in your development cycle. You iterate and you get better and you make your application more resilient, right? But the most important part here is really the takeaways. Think about error handling from the start, right? 
do not do it as an afterthought. Now, when we talk about SLAs, of course, everyone says, right, we want to get 100% uptime. It turns out it's very hard to achieve, right? I think like network telco equipment gets to like five nines, six nines and so forth. But it's a already very, very specialized network equipment tuned specifically for availability, right? Regular applications not even get close into that area. And also if you think about um, availability, it's also about even if we have 100% uptime, do we, it, it, does it make sense to get 100% availability if 50% of our users leave the website because we like we have 10 seconds of response times, right? The system technically is available, but our users cannot really use it, right? So the question must always be, at our maximum acceptable latency, and this is something people don't think about as well. You say, I want thousands of operations per second, but at what latency, right? Because you can throw threads at the problem, but at some point your latency will shoot through the roof and we'll see in a bit why that is. So first define what maximum latency is acceptable for my requirements, and then you do your benchmarking and your testing, and then you, you, get, you, you get to see what throughput do I get at that ma maximum latency, right? And then you have a clear defined boundary where your system can operate in and you can properly measure when it's going out of that boundary, right? If you don't do that upfront, there is no way to measure and see what's going on in your system upfront. Now, I'd like to draw analogies sometimes. And there is, in, in aviation, there is what's called the coffin corner. Who's heard about the coffin corner before? Okay, quite a few. So the thing is, at some point, so when, when you're, you're flying your airplane here and, and there is the, the, the flight level, like flight level 400, 300, and so forth. And here we have our speed, our cruise speed. And at some point, the higher up we get with our airplane, interestingly, um, the, the time, uh, so the speed uh, we need to maintain our altitude um, crosses here in this corner with uh, the speed, it actually takes that the, the airplane is stalling, right? So if, if you just climb, climb, and climb, at some point, you will fall down um, to earth even if you maintain a, a good cruising altitude, right? So, of course, uh, airplane pilots are trained to not go over there and, and, and just keep, keep cruising here. The important part here is airplanes are not, they don't like to work in the extremes, and so, so does your application, right? You, you do not want to operate your applications in the extremes. And if you, if you provision your system that it's always running at 90% load, right, you get contention, you get, you get, so you get resource contention, you get all sorts of problems. So the important part here is make sure you keep enough headroom so your system operates in a nice fashion. It, it, it's humming along nicely. So you can, you basically, you plan for outliers. You don't keep it running at 90, 95%, and you don't run into contention scenarios on your disks, on your network, and your operating system, and so forth. So keep some headroom to fly smoothly, and don't try, try to not go into the extremes. The other thing is you want to prepare for bad weather, right? Um, and We'll be drawing a few uh, airplane analogies <laughs> along the way now. So how can you prepare for bad weather in your application? The first thing is error detection. And error detection is, is not try catch and lock the, the error message in the, in the catch block, right? It, it goes much, much further. So if you want to do proper error detection, you need to employ system monitors, right? You need to, you need to have system monitoring in place that, that's tied into your application so you always see what's, what's going on in the system. And then you can apply techniques to your code like periodic checking. So you can do things like heartbeats or regular workouts. So you send messages to your remote system, see if it's alive, even if no traffic is going through. Uh, you can use a technique like watchdogs. Watchdogs sit in between components. They measure the traffic that's going through those components. And if something is wrong or something is, is out of the normal, um, you can alert it. And then you can guide error recovery um, with those. If you if you use redundancy, like, like you're fanning out to two or three components to get redundant results to make sure you increase your availability, um, you, you don't need to discard those results right away. What you can do is you can apply voting, for example. If you get three results, you can check the contents of those, and then you take the one where the majority agrees on it and use that result. So you, you can do things like voting to increase your confidence in the result. And then, of course, um, depending on especially if you're working in lower level languages, you want to do things like routine auditing. So like if you have linked lists and so forth, you can make sure they are not, so, so parts of, of the data structures are not like illegal pointers and so forth. Make sure your application keeps running steadily. In high level languages like Java, that's not so big of a deal, but you can still make sure like uh, you don't have stale references somewhere and, and your application just doesn't stop working like a few months later because you run into a memory leak and so forth. 
Now, once we've detected the error, we need to recover from it. And there are many techniques. Um, the most important one are timeouts, which we'll talk about in a bit. But there are more advanced strategies like failing over to redundant components. You can do intelligent retries. You can fall back um, to, to static, um, to static uh, re responses and so forth. So there are many techniques out available. But, but again, you need to think about how can I, in a, in a very consistent way, recover from my errors. It's not just try catch and then we'll see what happens. You need to upfront clearly define how is my error path, right? If this is happening, I need to know upfront where I'm propagating the error. Sometimes you can contain the error and do things like retry inside a component, but at some point you probably need to propagate the error up the stack, but you need to define this upfront. You cannot just throw the error um, up the stack and wait what happens, but you need to have a clearly defined escalation path inside the application, right? And then <coughs> there are other techniques to mitigate errors uh, up front, like intelligent data structures, things like, um, which we'll see in a bit, uh, ring buffers, bounded queues help you with that. Um, you should fail fast to load shedding uh, to make sure that if your system is in an overload condition, you don't make, it, you don't make the matters worse. You actually want to make it better by, um, uh, by getting things like smart patching, as we'll see in a bit. And techniques like circuit breakers help you a lot with, uh, with feeling, dealing with uh, failed, uh, failed systems, failed remote systems. And there is a remotely, um, remotely attached concept, concept called back pressure, which you can use to fail fast and, and basically build those circuit breakers. Now, one of my favorite topics, timeouts. I, it's like 50% of my work day I spent on timeouts and timeout exceptions. That's probably a small segregation, but it, it comes quite close, right? But Timeouts, as Matt said, are a good thing, right? Of course, when you see a timeout exception implication, you think, oh, what's going on there? But timeouts are good because if you don't have a timeout, something bad is happening anyway, but you're not releasing from there, right? If you don't have a timeout, your threads or what, whatever system is, is, is taking the data from there is blocked, right? It will never unblock. It will never go out of that state, right? So my recommendation is always use timeouts and set reasonable timeouts. Here's an example from, from the Java SDK. So we, we load a document from the server and here we set the timeout to five seconds, right? So by default, it's set to two and a half and, and here we're setting it to five. Now, we, we did push out the, to the OSDK, the Java SDK, and, and I was eagerly looking for feedback. And, and there was a guy asking a question on our forums. He was like, how can I do this and that? And, and I looked at his code and what I found was this. So. He was, <laughs> he was tuning the timer to, I, I don't even know what it's like. Yeah, it's like waiting forever, basically, in software terms, right? And I was sitting at home because I'm working from home in Vienna. We don't have an office at, uh, in, in Vienna. And I was like, surely you, you can't be serious, right? <laughs> so what's going on there, right? So, so I, <laughs> I see that over and over again. So, so please use useful timeouts and always apply those timeouts to your system, right? Another technique um, is the circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker, I think it, it, it showed up in a, uh, first in a book called Ship It from Michael Newgard. I really recommend it to check out that book if you're interested in that. <coughs> and what, what he, he, he also works a lot with critical systems and tries to figure out how to make them more available in, in a production scenario. And one technique, the circuit breaker, he, he comes up with is, is like, it works really much like a circuit breaker on an airplane or in your home. And the idea is that <laughs> if your system, like your electricity or uh, anything in your application layer, becomes unstable or there's something critical going on, it just flips the switch, the circuit opens, right? And nothing is allowed to pass through anymore. Current stops flowing. And the analogy here is that we, we stop sending traffic to our remote machine. So if, you, let's say you, you send an HTTP request to your server and you get a response back. If you wrap it into circuit breaker, traffic is flowing through nicely, right? Everything is going fine. Suddenly our server dies for whatever reason. The circuit breaker sees that um, the operations start failing, so the circuit will open, and every uh, requested incoming will be immediately rejected, right? Making sure that our target system, which is already in a bad condition, doesn't get worse. So we're giving it time to recover, and what the circuit breaker will do, it, it will let one request uh, go through uh, at some point in time to see if that single request succeeds. If it does, our circuit breaker sees, right, our target system is back up again, it will close, and it will let traffic flow through again, right? So very intelligent technique uh, to deal with failed systems. Now what circuit breakers ideally also do is they, they collect metrics uh, in the background. And the reason for that is, um, as it's proven in distributed systems, you cannot know if a system is slow or it is down, right? It's proven that you, you cannot distinguish those scenarios. So 
it is collecting metrics and you can also say, well, if my latency goes, for example, over like 500 milliseconds, the circuit breaker will also open. And this gives us an opportunity to go to a fallback, like go to another server or return a static fallback, depending on, on what we want to achieve. Now, one of those circuit breaker implementations which became very popular in the last year or so is uh, Hustrix uh, from, from Netflix. And the actual implementation doesn't matter so much, but what I wanted to give you is the high level overview of how it works because it's very interesting and it has a very intelligent design. So mm, we are constructing what here is called the Hustrix command and this is nothing more than basically we wrap our original request to the server inside this command so it does all those fancy things around that. Now we, get, we send in the request and then it checks is the circuit currently open. If it is open, uh, we short circuit immediately saying the, the, the message has failed, right? If it's closed, we just let the message go through. And the important part here is this feedback loop, right? So here is the feedback loop which um, calculates the circuit health to make sure um, the, the, the latency measurement and throughput um, is in our thresholds that we accept. Now, once, let's say, our remote system goes down, for example, the message will time out or an exception will be thrown, so the circuit opens, and then the message gets to an explicit, here it's the method called get fallback, right? So we explicitly think about what, what, what we need to do if the message is failing, right? This is an important thing because most of the time when you talk to remote service, you just expect a good response. But here the API is forcing us into thinking what we need to do if something goes wrong, right? It's an important distinction. So, for example, we can say, all right, we, we don't implement the fallback, then of course the exception will be uh, propagated. But we can return a static fallback or we can go to another server and so forth. So that's all provided part of the circuit breaker. Very intelligent design and, and easy to use, especially if you're in a Java context and you're looking for something like that. You can pick up Hustrix and, and, and get go very quickly. Now, another concept that I'd quickly like to talk about is back pressure. So, back pressure allows us for coordinated flow under stress conditions. Now, what does that mean? You can use back pressure to shed load um, to provide a partial good experience instead of a worse experience to everyone. Now, let me draw another analogy and give you a quick story. Now, imagine you, it, it's late in the evening and you need, to, you need to send a letter and you need to go to the post office, right? So regular stale mail. And you, you go there and you see there is a long, long queue already in the post office. And you know, it's closing in five minutes. I will never get, get, get served at the, at the counter, right? So you don't go queue up there and wait five minutes and then it closes and then you go home, right? You will turn around immediately, go home and try the next morning, right? And this is the same idea in software. You don't want to accept traffic if you know upfront that you cannot serve it for, for various reasons. For example, your system is in, in an overload condition you don't want to accept traffic. You know that you, you're, not, you're not going to serve that in a proper time frame, right? So what you want to do instead is you want to fail fast, immediately telling the, the producer, hey, I'm not able to, um, to, to serve your request in the meaningful time. And then it's up to the producer to decide what he wants to do, right? He can implement retry logic, but the producer can also decide to propagate the error, maybe even back to his HTTP a layer where he got called, like returning HTTP 500, or I think there is an HTTP code to say come back later or so forth, right? So the important part here is if you would have accepted the traffic, and then 30 seconds in, we would see, oh, no, we are not going to serve the traffic and then fail. We've already lost 30 seconds where the, the, the caller could have done something else, right? That's very important. Now, one technique to implement back pressure and failing fast is uh, a ring buffer, or it's like, a, Basically, it's a bounded queue, so it's a queue with a bounded size, right? It's not an unbounded queue, that's quite important. So what you can, well, and, and this is a technique we're using in the Java SDK, for example, to make sure that we are not only um, separating the application threads from the I.O. layer, but also to provide explicit back pressure, right? Imagine your application threads are sending so many requests into the Java client, and we are not able to serve it because in-memory computations are faster than network, right? So if you're overrunning the system at some point, our ring buffer will be full, and at this point, um, we will immediately fail back to you saying, hey, you are, you're overrunning the service, right? And then it's up to you to decide, do you want to retry, do you want to fail back, and so forth, right? And this is how it works. So if you've used the new SDK and wondered what the back pressure exception is about, that's the reason, okay? One, one other thing <coughs> I'd like to talk about is testing and benchmarking, uh, another one of my favorite topics. Um, 
I'm not going to cover benchmarking and, and those benchmarks that the marketing team puts out all the time. Um, so I'm working in engineering. Um, that's up to the marketing folks. So we're, we're trying to talk about proper benchmarks, right, and proper testing. So this is another thing that I see out there a lot. It's like people are trying Couchbase, trying to evalu evaluate systems, and they're doing things like this. While true, and then fetch a document from the server. It's like, why is this going slow? And who has ever done this? Two? OK. So I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not offending you, right? I'm, I'm sorry. But it's th the big problem. So it, it's a valid benchmark if there would be your production code, right? If you're writing code to produce heat and, and warm your office, uh, that's probably the, the best way to, to benchmark a system. But <laughs> the, big, the big problem with, with, a, with a benchmark like this is that it's not realistic, right? You are going to hit the database from a multiple amount of threads. You have think time, right? You're hitting separate documents. For example, what, you, what it's not obvious here is as well that um, on Couchbase server, there is also different if you hit one document all the time or if you hit 1,000 different documents all the time, right? You're hitting different nodes in the class and so forth. So I've seen that uh, a lot as well. And I was like, you're joking, right? <laughs> we, we, we get lots of those. Uh, uh, not lots, but quite, quite a few of those inquiries from uh, pre-sales and so forth. So of course, I'll try to help with them and, and set up proper benchmarks. And we'll eventually get there. So that, that's probably a good sign. All right, so if that's not a good thing to do, what is the right thing to do? Or what, what is benchmarking? And I tr tried to coming up with, with a, like an explanation. To me, benchmarking in essential asserts expectations, right? It's about expectations what my target system is able to provide at certain conditions, right? But testing in the opposite is verifying the correctness, right? Which means that if you write a benchmark which gives you hundreds of thousands of operations per second, but it's returning hundreds of thousands of wrong results every second, uh, it's probably passing your benchmarking suite, but uh, your tests are probably wrong, right? And it's not going to help you in a production case. And also, um, especially when it comes to uh, competitive benchmarks to other like databases and systems, it, it's, not, it's not only related to databases. They're very often wrong and biased in, in, in a way that, um, it, it especially if, if you look at those uh, competitive benchmarks that like marketing puts out there, you can clearly see that they don't try to make it objective because every database company wants to make this one look great. But I mean, for, for marketing, maybe it's fine. But for engineering, if you are really want to evaluate your system that you're going to run in production, you need to be very careful, um, for example, to not write your benchmark that looks better on one database or the other, right? Or even you have one, one test suite and for, for one database, and then, oh, let's try the an another one. You build a simple interface, and you plug it in there, and it's probably not best practice for that specific design and so forth. So for me, the key takeaway is that benchmarking requires lots and lots of thought. You need to put lots of brain power into writing a good benchmark, right? And I think. Who has heard the, the term of there are two, pro two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things? I would argue there's a third one, and that's benchmarking, OK? <laughs> so the more I try to do it right, uh, the more I, I see how hard it actually is if you want to do it really uh, in, a, in a really correct fashion. So just to give you some, some food of thought, if you want to do proper benchmarking, the first thing you need to think about is the appropriate workload, right? What, how does my production use case look like exactly, right? How, how many concurrent clients are targeting my system, right? How many think times do I have between, let's say, user clicks, right? What's going on? Um, do I have bursts of traffic? Do I have continuous traffic? All those things need to be taken into account up front. And wh what you see out there a lot is like you have one client, like JMeter, and then you have one application server, and then you test it within a benchmark. But in practice, you have lots and lots of small different um, producer systems hitting your application server, which produces a very different uh, type of load than instead of one big thing hitting another big thing, right? You need to think very careful about how you're measuring your benchmarks. Now, another thing is the right environment. If you're running on Linux in your production system, do not benchmark on Mac OS or on Windows, right? Um, it, it, but it's something that I see very commonly. For example, if you use Java, if you use NIO, the Java client, um, every NIO implementation in JVM is different. On, on Linux, it's using ePol. On Mac, it's using KQ. And on Windows, it's using, I don't know whatever it's using on Windows, but definitely <laughs> neither KQ nor ePol, right? <laughs> and, and the thing is, they are implemented completely differently. So you can be sure that, that if you benchmark something on Windows, on Linux, it's going to perform better, the same workload, just because the ePol implementation is much better tested in the JVM on, uh, for Linux than on Windows. 
right? And then also there are lots of external effects like I uh, showed before, right? If you have a monitoring system grabbing a hot lock on your system, um, this is going to heavily impact your benchmark results, right? And then also pick the proper tool, right? It's very important. Measure your tool. First implement a knob benchmark to, to benchmark, basically to measure the overhead of your benchmarking suite. If you write your benchmarking suite in Java, it's also subject to garbage collection. There is a, a term called coordinate omission, which you probably want to look at if you want to implement such a tool. Uh, you, you can find it on the web. Be aware of garbage collection, coordinated omission, and all of those side effects that are not subject to your target system, but actually the system that produces those messages, right? Lots and lots of things to think about very carefully. Now, what about the industry? Um, another one of my favorite topics, the YCSP, the dreaded Yahoo cloud serving benchmark, right? Seems like everyone is using it and no one is really looking at implementations. And I've never, I've never come across a, a customer who is using YCSP in production, right? For I don't know, again, to produce heat for uh, the office or something. Um, and the pitfall there is it makes it too easy, in my opinion, to compare solutions, right? It's like this one model fits all. There's like a five method interface. You implement it for every database, and then you just see what's, what's, what's falling out on the other end. The problem is, for example, with Couchbase, we are very good at asynchronous workloads, and YCSP only supports synchronous workloads, right? There are so many things to consider. Um, YCSP doesn't really care about JSON, right? You can do much more with Couchbase with JSON than you can do with YCSP. So just throwing YCSP at the problem maybe doesn't even resemble your, your production use case. And, and then there are other related problems with YCSP, especially it's not quite maintained, there are lots of problems. So um, since if you cannot fight something, you, you probably want to go fix it. Um, a few people uh, forked YCSP under that GitHub URL um, and including us, so Couchbase, Datastacks, and some other people from JVM companies, um, we, we try to make it better. Um, and currently there is discussion going on to merge that back upstream into the original YCSP. Um, that's still all in flux, but you can see that we're making progress there. But just again as a food of thought, maybe YCSP doesn't really fit the use case and you, you want to really evaluate if YCSP is really what you want to measure. And to give you a, um, a final example on, on, on benchmarking, um, there is a tool for Java called GMH, Java Micro Benchmarking Harness, and it's actually a tool for um, unit, uh, so for micro benchmarks. So testing things like, do you have a hash map in Java? How long does the get method take, right? And what I wanted to show you here is that um, people from the OpenJDK team from Oracle are working on this on this tool, right? And I see lots of um, long start equals system nano time, long end, or even with uh, current time millis in Java, and then you try to figure out the time that an operation did take. And the problem is that those benchmarks all fall apart um, at, a micro, at, a, at a micro scale. And here's one example of why that is true. This is from um, a talk from Alexei Shipilev, and I'm sure pr I pronounced his name wrong. He's one of the main authors um, of JBH. He works on, at Oracle on, on Java performance. And this is what you can see, the, what, what is called uh, optimization plateaus. So the JVM has an optimizer built in and it's compiling code from interpretation into actual C code at runtime, depending on what methods are hot. And you can see that um, as time progresses, um, you can see that more and more code is compiled, right? And, and things get much faster. But if you write a very naive implementation of your, of your benchmark and you benchmark your results here, but um, actually what's going on if you wait any longer, um, the, 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 the numbers would be much, much better. Right, so things like um, optimizations and um, system time hiccups and, and other things that fall into place. So if you do um, micro benchmarking on Java, this is really the tool to go, right? Uh, don't do um, while true and measure the nano time or even current time millis. Um, just as a side note, current time millis on, 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 on the JVM is not, not even guaranteed to be um, like atomic and linearly increasing, right? So, and those methods also take time, so anyways, if you're on the JVM, pick this tool. I just wanted to show you that there is, there are, if you want to do it properly, there are so many things to consider uh, if you want to do it right. Um, it's not just easy. Now, a final thing I want to talk about is testing, load and stress testing. So in, in addition to benchmarking and unit tests and integration tests, you want to do load testing to properly assert that your system under load is running stable uh, during normal traffic, right? You can do that with uh, tools to, uh, to create load, which uh, Matt will cover in a bit, but make sure to not run it like five minutes. Run it for days to make sure it's su sustaining the traffic. Because if you run it for five minutes, 
and you have a small memory leak in your application, after one day it probably will fall apart, but for five minutes it will work fine. And then <coughs> once you've asserted that is true, you can go into stress testing. And stress testing is really putting your system um, explicitly into the coffin corner, right? You want to test the edge cases. You want to see how it performs um, and works during uh, edge cases. And the reason for that is if you know how your system works during those edge cases, you can make much more educated guesses what you should do if things fall apart, right? If you have no idea how your system reacts in those cases, you don't know what measures, uh, what, no, what, what actions to take afterwards, right? Very important. If, so make sure you know where your things fall apart, right? At some point, every system will fall apart. It's important to know when and where that's going to happen. Now, a final note on failure testing. Um, failure testing is a little different in a way that you want to test for specific failure cases with the target system. In the couch-based case, for example, what you want to test is node failures. How does my application work if a node goes down, right? What happens during rebalance? Does it, um, of course it's supposed to work, but is it, does it really, right? Maybe there is a bug in the SDK that something falls apart, right? Uh, it could be. Um, um, I mean, it was never one in the quiz before, but it could be. <laughs> so we, we do have bugs in Couchbase, I admit. Um, <laughs> and there were net splits, firewall issues. We have seen that um, during idle time, firewalls did close sockets and they didn't tell neither the server nor the client, right? See what's going on there. Uh, make and, and then again, make sure it's running in a setup that resembles production, right? It doesn't make sense to test firewall issues if you're running a completely different firewall setup in production than you do in your test environment, right? It it's not going to assert anything. So again, bottom line, fail failures will happen. Prepare for it early so you're prepared when things fall apart. So finally, I'd like to um, give back to uh, Matt for some tools to consider. Great, thanks, Michael. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this very, very quickly because I, I know we're uh, running short on time. So a couple tools of the trade uh, in the world of Couchbase. So uh, one thing that we uh, had, had authored, maybe some of you have used in the past. By the way, a lot of these tools for uh, benchmarking, I don't, I don't actually think, you know, even the, the silly little uh, while true uh, test, that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you recognize what you're getting out of it. You know, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't give you a lot. So what we've done is at Couchbase, we do have a few uh, tools that are available. These are in some cases part of SDK distribution. Some in some cases, they're, they're separate projects. Uh, we have um, things like uh, Lib Couchbase has something called CBC Pillow Fight. Uh, Pillow Fight uh, was a, a tool originally written by Tron Norby. Now it's maintained by Martin Runeberg. Uh, the uh, idea is that it can just generate a workload. Uh, there's also Java's Roadrunner and .NET's Meet Meet. Each one of these is really good just for doing basic system characterization. If you've ever used Apache Bench in the past, uh, Apache Bench I kind of consider to be one of those things like, eh, I'm going to run it against the server, and if it, you know, if, if latencies are super high, then it tells me there's something wrong about my setup. It's, it doesn't tell me that it's right. Doesn't tell me that it, that that uh, that I'm correct. The other thing is that. Uh, and almost every one of those that we talked about earlier, we had to go through a, um, a way of kind of isolating where the issue was. So Lib Couchbase, the Java SDK, both have um, uh, an ability to do performance profiling, get histograms, understand what's happening t at the internals. And then you do the same thing over at the uh, cluster side, but with, with things like CB stats timings. And so obviously, if the server says, hey, I'm send sending everything back uh, very fast, and the client is having issues, then the, the problem is possibly somewhere in that JVM side. And, and it can be vice versa. In some of the really complicated ones, we've had to go even to the level of, of doing packet traces on Spansport. So uh, we're out of time because we've gone a little long, but Michael and I are certainly available uh, for questions later. So I want to say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.